In the late 11th century, at the request of King Alfonso VI of Leon and Castile, nobles from Western Europe arrived in the Iberian Peninsula to help in the reconquista against the Moors. Two of those were the cousins Raymond of the County of Burgundy and Henry of the Duchy of Burgundy. Soon after their arrival, they married two of Alfonso's daughters. Urraca, daughter of Queen Constance of Burgundy, was married to Raymond, while Teresa, the result of an extramarital affair with the Leonese noblewoman, Jimena de Munoz, was married to Henry. Years later, Raymond, displeased with the decrease of his influence in the king's court, planned to, with the help of his cousin, remove Alfonso from power. Meanwhile, the king got word of the overthrowing plot and, wisely, made Henry Count of Portugal. This put the two cousins' focus on each other, thus ending the overthrowing plans. A few years later, in 1106, Raymond died aged 37. Over time, Henry would expand the borders of the county of Portugal south. In 1109, Henry and Teresa had a son, who they named Afonso after his grandfather, Alfonso VI, who died in the same year. In the Leonese Castilian kingdom, the throne passed to his daughter, Urraca. Three years later, Henry died, and Teresa became the sole Countess of Portugal. Her time of rule was marked by rebellions against her sister, whom she fought in 1116 and 1120, even naming herself Queen of Portugal. Eventually, she was captured and defeated in 1121, being forced by her sister to accept the title of Countess. In that time of rebellion, she grew closer to Fernando Pérez de Trava, the most powerful nobleman in Galicia, which displeased the Portuguese nobles of the county's court, whom, one by one, were being replaced by the Galician aristocracy. Two of the most important years of her rule were 1126 and 1127, when the Templars arrived in Portugal. Teresa became the first noble to give them a castle in Europe, the Castle of Sur. Upon the boy's birth, he was given to a tutor, the nobleman Egas Munich, who raised him together with his son, also named Afonso. As it was already mentioned, with the arrival of the Galician nobles, Egas and others lost their positions in the court. It was in this context that Egas started to incite the feelings of revolt in Afonso against the now corrupt rule of his mother. When Afonso turned 11, he joined the court of the county. In the years that followed, he grew close to the Archbishop of Braga, Dom Pai Mendes who was also displeased with the political situation in the county. This clergyman ended up being expelled from it in 1125, but brought Afonso with him to Zamora, where the prince knighted himself, as it was the costume with kings. Despite this, Afonso lived in the court of the county until 1127, when he started to openly rebel against his mother's rule. Meanwhile, Queen Iraq died in 1126, and her son Alfonso came to power, becoming Alfonso VII. The young monarch held the title of Emperor of all Spain, therefore he expected the vassalage of all the central and western Christian territories of the peninsula. As the county of Portugal remained rebellious in its attitude towards the king, he invaded it in 1127. The Portuguese prince was in Guimarães, that ended up being besieged for his refusal to recognize his cousin as king of those territories. The siege ended up being lifted because of a promise made by Egas Mendes to Alfonso VII that Afonso would swear his loyalty. Either way, nothing could stop the young prince of his ambitions to rule Portugal, and on the 24th of June of 1128, while Alfonso VII was traveling to Barcelona to meet his wife, Afonso Henrique and his supporters, including Agas Muniz, faced Teresa and Fernando de Traba at the Battle of São Mamed. The result was a decisive victory for the young prince, which led to the exile of his mother to Galicia. Afonso thus became the new Count of Portugal. Two years later, on the 1st of November 1130, with Teresa's death, the opposition to the new Count of Portugal became impossible, since he was the legitimate successor to rule the territory. The first ten years of Afonso's rule saw the construction of castles in the north to defend the county from possible Leonese attacks and the rise of incursions to the south so that the Muslims were discouraged of invading. In 1131, Afonso moved his court to Coimbra. From 1132 to 1133, the Count of Portugal invaded Galicia once again and conquered part of Lima, building a castle there. Meanwhile, in 1134, on the northeast of the peninsula, a new Navarrese king rose to power, 
Afonso VII wanted his vassalage, but he refused. The Portuguese and the Navarrese would then make an alliance, where they attacked the Leonese Castilian king from the west and east. The province of Galicia was there for the taking, but the Portuguese count was forced to retreat to face a Muslim threat at the castle of Liria. The Muslims attacked it to prevent possible attempted conquests by the Portuguese of Santarém, Sintra and Lisbon. The defenders of the castle were killed and without them, the city of Coimbra was at danger. But another problem arose. The king of Leon Castile was now ready to reconquer Tui from the Portuguese. Given the gravity of the situation in the south, Afonso opted for peace with the Christian kingdom of the north, returning Tui to his cousin by signing the Treaty of Tui. In 1139, two years after peace was assured in the northern borders, it was time to focus on crusading in the south. Afonso departed from Coimbra, joined by important nobles and 2,000 men to face the Almoravids in their territory. At the same time, his Leonese cousin launched a campaign to Oreja, where he besieged the city held by the Berber dynasty. This combined attack was meant to split the attention of the Moors into two different fronts. The army passed by Ledeia and crossed the Tagus River, east of Santarém, to avoid the watchtowers of the city. It went unnoticed, since at this time of the year, summer, the water levels were lower than usual, widening the passages. The rest of the path through the center and south of Portugal was made without opposition, but with much carefulness, because of the hundreds of kilometers that separated the troops from their bases in the north. The fact that Afonso Henriques and Alfonso VII organized military incursions at the same time divided the attention of the Almoravids, who sent a lot of troops to Toledo to defend the great city from a possible invasion by Alfonso VII. The military incursion was successful and probably reached Seville, which greatly angered Muhammad ibn Umar, who now called several of the troops sent to Toledo to stop the son of Henry, this time leaving the northern territories of Al Andalus with fewer defenders, which helped Alfonso VII in the siege of Oreja. The Muslim governor gathered an army of 10,000 to try and intercept the Portuguese on their way back home. In late July of 1139, the large Muslim army reached the Portuguese in Oric. Afonso, realizing there was no way of avoiding the fight, made camp in a high field to ready his men for war. On the same day, the 24th of July 1139, the 30-year-old Afonso was acclaimed king by his men, who, in the way of their Visigothic and Swabian ancestors, held him high on top of a shield. 25th of July 1139, the lines were formed. The Moors greatly outnumbered the Portuguese, having brought 10,000 men, while the Iberians only counted with around 2,000. The Europeans would have to count on their greatest advantage, the heavy cavalry, which at that time was a decisive force in winning battles. On the Portuguese side, the vanguard was led by Garcia Mendes de Souza, with 300 of his best knights, who formed two or three lines, supported by a higher number of infantrymen. The rear guard was commanded by the king, from where he would command his army, and had at his disposal the same number of knights, but more infantrymen than Souza. Also, Two wings around the vanguard prolonged it with 200 cavalrymen on each of them and several infantrymen to avoid envelopment maneuvers from the Muslims. The rest of the men stayed behind to guard the camp and the supply train. Most of the troops came from Coimbra, but some Templars coming from the castle of Sor participated in the battle too. On the Muslim side, the troops were divided in the following manner. A vanguard of light cavalry, a central body of infantry, two wings of cavalrymen and a mixed rear guard of infantrymen and cavalrymen. On the morning of the day, after the Urangis by the commanders of both armies, the Almoravids, to the sound of loud drums, took the offensive with hit-and-run tactics, with the goal of breaking the Portuguese formation. But the lines held firm. Soon after, the Portuguese launched an attack by the heavy cavalry, moving straight. It was successful and broke the first Almoravid lines, but the center held the charge. More charges came to reinforce the first one, but this time from the light cavalry, that tried to create breaches and destroy the Muslim flanks of the center. After the charges, hand-to-hand -hand fighting broke out. The better armed Portuguese were doing better and constantly advancing. Meanwhile, the Almoravids tried to attack the wings aiming for the rearguard of the Portuguese, but it held firm, stopping the Muslim attack. By 12 pm, the Muslim troops began to break, and the battle ended with the North African army retreating. 20 to 50 percent of the Almoravid army was killed. On the Portuguese side, the casualties were lower.
the Christians then stayed in their well-defended camp for three days to better defend from possible falling attacks, to rest and to prepare themselves for the dangerous route home, but also because it was the costume back then to show dominance and victory. After the victory, Afonso returned to Coimbra. There, in the capital of Portugal, he was received in celebration, and more importantly, as a king.